you are about to experience, Jackson Snyder presents. Direct from the Vero Essien Yahad, a Hebrew Nation radio original program. JSP is a variety show seeking out Jewish and Christian origins, religion, theology and history, and doing so in a fashion that is both educational and entertaining. Welcome to Jackson Snyder Presents. I would like to start this expose of the 364-day calendar with a couple of comments. This should go on the end, but I know people don't listen that long. And so, when the Bible literalists, who only know Genesis chapter 1, tells you as though they were experts in the subject, that the moon runs the calendar, and you don't have anything to say about that, or they say that in the Bible, the moon runs the calendar, and you don't have anything to say about that, go to Ezekiel, because we find the 364-day calendar, as marked out by many, many, many scholars, to appear in Ezekiel, and primarily through the days that he prophesies. All right, that's all I want to say, because whenever I seem to bring this up with anybody, they go to Genesis 1, but they don't know the other books well enough, and they certainly don't know the prophets well enough to go any farther with an explanation. So, in this presentation, you'll find an explanation. And if you can somehow put this explanation in mighty few words, please let me know what you come up with. Because if there really is a millennium, and there really is a Davidic king, then there really is going to be a 364-day calendar with festivals connected to that in a completely different arrangement than our friends the Jews have today. And because it's completely different, if Elohim comes, then he'll have to do away with their system of time, because there are so, so many flaws in it that they could have avoided completely if they'd have gone back to the temple calendar previous to 170 BC and used that instead of this man-made moon calendar. Okay, that's the end. Here's the beginning. I went to Interlibrary Loan to try to find a particular book published by Brill, which is an academic publisher, whose publications are very expensive. So I'm selling my books, you know, my Theology and History Library. It's almost gone now. Probably got only a thousand volumes left. And so I'm not buying any more. And I am, though, still studying into the 364-day calendar, which this book addresses. It's called The Early Enoch Literature. It's edited by two experts, Gavriel Boccaccini and John J. Collins, and it's part of the supplements to the Journal for the Study of Judaism, Volume 121, Brill, 2007. If we go over to page 100, we have an article here by Paulo Saki, S-A-C-C-H-I, very prominent in Enochian Studies, a professor at the University of Turin, Italy. I've noticed that he's done several editions with Gavriel Boccaccini, who is the king of Enochian Studies. And just a little bit here of the beginning of the article. The aim of this article is to search for the origins of the Jewish calendars and to evaluate the significance of changes in relation to structures of thought. While the degree of importance calendars had to Jewish thought is yet to be fully determined, it was certainly great, as has recently attracted the attention of several scholars. And he comes up with a notion here that the 364-day calendar originated in the 3rd century BC. However, later on in the article, he says it succeeded a 364-day solar temple calendar based on a different philosophy, but that the calendars were logically equivalent. Okay, that tells us, though, that the 364 calendar went back way before 3rd century BC. Indeed, it went back before the exile. And I want to read 
a portion of this called Ezekiel and the 364-day calendar. It's got a few new things here. But the very fact that they can find the 364-day calendar in Ezekiel, and they can determine it's a solar calendar, and that Ezekiel also contains the inheritance of the sons of Zadok, that they are to be in charge of all temple affairs, all cultural affairs, all calendrical affairs, all liturgical affairs, forever, including today, we can deduce, or I go as far as to say, if Ezekiel's right, we can prove that this 364-day calendar was the norm, and will be again in a Davidic millennium. If you don't mind, I just would like to remind the hearers that uh, the house and sons of Zadok were to have complete rule over the temple and over worship and over the rest of the Levites, and you can find that very succinctly in Ezekiel 44, verse 15 through 27. And along with this is the calendar as well, and the liturgy, and judgment, and ministering to Yodhe So if one finds a Zedekite calendar, that ought to be the one being followed, because although the Zedekite priests were cut off around 171 BC, Yahweh declares through this prophet Ezekiel that they, the Zadokites, should have rule over these responsibilities forever. Uh, so as Brother Snyder mentioned, if Yahshua come back as the new David and take over with the government of the entire world, will he be calling on the new Sanhedrin in Jerusalem with their moon calendars to call the people to worship? Hmm, I don't think so. Will he call on some government on the lunisolar calendar to call people to worship? Not on your life. One of the things the Zadokites kept all along were the sacred days and times. That is, the feast calendar. They shall keep my laws and my statutes in all my appointed feasts, and they shall keep my Shabbatot holy, says the prophet. No, we won't be on secular calendar for feast days anymore. That will have to change and change in a moment. Okay, I'm all done now. I'm not sure I want you to be done yet. After looking up that reference in the prophet and having mentioned that the Zadokites were exiled and murdered somewhere around 171 BC, and the Zadokite calendar is out of style with the Jews of today, who then qualify as the Zadokites? Oh, that's a tough question, but the answer is very uh, simple. I just read it in scripture. Shall I read it once again? Uh, the sons of Zadok who kept the charge of my sanctuary when the people of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister to me, and they shall stand before me to offer me sacrifice, declares Yahweh Elohim, and they shall enter my sanctuary, and they shall approach my table and minister to me, and they shall keep my charge, and they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the common, and show them how to distinguish between the unclean and the clean. Now, brother, you tell me who are the Zadokites of today, who are teaching the holy ways, who are keeping the sacred and true calendar set up by Yahweh for the Zadokites to administrate. Who is keeping that calendar? Who is considered Levitical priests today? I don't think there's one person listening to this who can't answer a question now. Very well done. Let's get back to the text. And I quote, If there is a direct influence of Babylonian culture to be found in Ezekiel, it's in his vision of the cosmos, derived from what today we would call scientific notions. His vision of the universe broadens, becomes immense, 
favoring the formation of the image of Yahweh as the absolute soul Elohim. Ezekiel viewed the world through the lens of Babylonian astronomy, which becomes the key to understanding the role of the Elohim of Israel in history. Now, he starts right out here speaking about Ezekiel being influenced by Babylonian culture and Babylonian astronomy, but just wait a little bit in this article and you'll see that in many ways, Saki contradicts himself. There is a characteristic element in the book of Ezekiel. Fourteen dates are given, including the year, month, and day. Of these fourteen dates, thirteen regard his prophecies. Why is Ezekiel so interested in dating his prophecies down to the day? Why such precision? Was he overcome by a great historical interest in his prophecies? Or did the fact that a prophecy came about on one day rather than the other hold some particular value, recognized not only by him, but also by those it was addressed to? The 14th date does not regard a prophecy, but it does concern a singular event, arrival of the news that Jerusalem had fallen in 587. It's worth noting that Ezekiel doesn't use the pre-exile names for the month, nor does he use the Babylonian names, as the Jews would do later. Ezekiel refers to the months by number. This is an innovative way of indicating the months. If we read Ezekiel's dates, following the so-called solar calendar of the Enochians, Qumranians, and Essenes, which uses ordinal numbers for the months, we get some truly interesting results. Annie Jobert, whose hypothesis I'm following, already noticed this phenomenon. Jobert sought only to explain the difference in dates for the Last Supper between the Synoptic Gospels and John, but I would like to clarify the question by singling out its presuppositions. We need to go look at that essay by Jobert, too, concerning the three days in the tomb. Because what I think this is implying is that we're talking about days in accordance with with a 364-day calendar rather than the loony solar calendar that the Sadducees were using in the first century. Back to the text. The later solar calendar, as it appears in the Qumran texts, among others, is based on a normal 364-day year divided into 12 months. And we know this. The months are then divided into four groups corresponding to the time between equinox and solstice. The months each have 30 days except the last one of each period, the 3rd, 6th, 9th, and 12th, which have 31. The solstice, or equinox then, always falls on the 31st day of a 31-day month. And there's a footnote on here. The 31st days are the four days added to the normal month mentioned in the astronomical book in Enoch 75, 1 and 2. These are the days with no movement. Some call them intercalary days, but I don't. Since 364 can be divided by 7, the first day of the year always fell on the same day of the week, Wednesday, the day that Elohim created the sun and moon and therefore the possibility of measuring time. In this calendar, the seven-day week becomes a factor of the days of the year, 364 divided by 7, and the two measures fit together. The phases of the moon were left out. The Book of Jubilees, when telling of the creation of the stars, on the fourth day of creation, adds this phrase to the biblical text found in Jubilees 2.9. Or might we say that the Masoretes left this phrase out of the redaction of Genesis? Elohim gave the sun as a great star on earth to indicate the days, the weeks, the months, the holy days, the years, the Shabbatot, the Jubilees, 
and all the periods of the year, unquote. Again, that's Jubilees 2.9. The month became a division of the year. The moon was left out. After the day, the fundamental measure of time was the year, with the week as a subdivision. This would create problems, he says. And there's a long, long footnote here concerning the rotations of the priests. As we can deduce from the astronomical book, this 364-day calendar was derived from an older one, identical in structure, though based on a different philosophy. The earlier one, still of 364 days, was the form that Ezekiel knew, and in fact, it probably originated in his own circles. In this early phase, the solar year was divided into 12 months of 30 days each, leaving the four days of the equinoxes and the solstices out of the calculation. The true year, then, had 360 days, to which four days had to be added outside the normal day count. These four days, the equinoxes and solstices, were days in which the sun stood still. A lack of movement was interpreted as a lack of time. I think that whole paragraph just makes this calendar much more befuddling than it should be. Befuddling. 360-day year, four days that the sun doesn't move, put them in on the third month of each quarter. Why don't we just say 364 days, 30, 30, 31, and forget when the year ends. Just start the year up with the equinox again, and that's what I believe they did. I do not take those four days as intercalary, and I don't understand the end of the year that any intercalary days were needed because they're lining up the beginning of the year with a solstice. Beginning with the solstice is always going to line itself up with the 365.12 or whatever it is, days. The 360 days were the 360 degrees of the horizon called days divided into 12 months corresponding to the 12 signs of the zodiac. Shouldn't we call that Maserot? As we can see, the four days out of time have no space either to move. The coincidence even concerning the names between measures of space and time creates a unitary system, which we can call a cosmic system. In practical terms, the two calendars were identical. He's talking about Ezekiel's calendar and the priestly temple calendar. The strong day of the week was Wednesday, and each year began on Wednesday. The week basis of the priestly liturgy was a measure that fit perfectly in the year. Now, Saki says, we must turn our attention to the dates of Ezekiel's prophecies and visions in order to see some meaning in these dates as linked to a particular calendar. This is where the proof comes in. Of the 13 dates given for visions, in nine cases the text is certain. All the Jewish and non-Jewish traditions agree. Now pay attention. The dates with the days of the week are the fifth day of the fourth month, a Sunday, Ezekiel 1, 1. The twelfth day, huh, looks like there is a typo in here. I'm going to say the twelfth day of typo, a Sunday, Ezekiel 3, 15 through 16. The tenth day of the fifth month, another Sunday, three in a row, Ezekiel 20 and 1. The tenth day of the tenth month, which is a Friday, Ezekiel 24, 1. I think that's the uh, trumpets. The first day of of the first month, which is a Wednesday, is equal 2917. The seventh day of the first month, which is a Tuesday, Ezekiel 30, 20. The first day of the third month, which is a Sunday, Ezekiel 31 and 1. The first day of the twelfth month, which is a Sunday, Ezekiel 32 and 1. And finally, the tenth day of the seventh month, a Friday, Ezekiel 41. Now, you calendar creators, you might want to write those down and map them. Map them to your calendar. Check out those prophecies of Ezekiel. Each of these nine dates regards a prophecy of Ezekiel, including 
the tenth day of the tenth month, the beginning of the siege of Jerusalem, but the date is given as a revelation during a vision. It should therefore be considered a prophecy alongside the others. We obtain the following results. Five prophecies took place on Sunday, one on Wednesday, two on Friday, one on Tuesday. Now apart from Tuesday, which is a common day, we see that Wednesday is the strongest day of the week, while Friday and Sunday are opening and closing moments of the sacrality of the Sabbath. Moving from the dates confirmed by the entire tradition to those with variants, we obtain the following results, which can easily be inserted into the same schema. The date in chapter 8, verse 1, is the first day of the sixth month, a Sunday following the Hebrew Codex Petropolitanus of the year 916, as opposed to the fifth day of the sixth month, a Wednesday in the common Masoretic text, and the fifth day of the fifth month, a Tuesday in the Septuagint. The number of the month has been lost in the datation of chapter 26, 1, in all the tradition, but the number of the day remains. Since it is the first of the month, there are only three days possible. Wednesday, as in months 1, 4, 7, and 10. Friday, as in months 2, 5, 8, and 11. Or Sunday, as in months 3, 6, 9, and 12. In chapter 29, 1, the Masoretic text gives the 12th day of the 10th month a Sunday, while the Septuagint has the first day of the 10th month, which is a Wednesday. In chapter 32, 17, the Masoretic text gives the 10th day of the 5th month, again a Sunday, while the Septuagint again gives a Wednesday, the 15th of the first month. Yes, we're almost through with these. The date contained in 3321, the fifth day of the tenth month, regards the day Ezekiel received news of the fall of Jerusalem and is not important for us here. At any rate, in the Masoretic text, the fifth day of the tenth month is once again a Sunday, while the Septuagint gives the fifth day of the twelfth month a Thursday. Excluding the date that news of the fall of Jerusalem arrived, there is a preponderance of strong days of the week, Sunday in particular, as suitable for prophecies. Even the case of the variants are interesting. In both 29.1 and 32.17, the Masoretic text gives a Sunday and the Septuagint a Wednesday. It seems that the existence of particularly sacred days of the week, and therefore days more suited to manifestations of the sacred, could guide conjectures when there were problems reading the model manuscript. When uncertain, the Septuagint opted for Wednesday. I wonder why. Do you get it? Why the Septuagint would opt for Wednesday, considering what the calendar was at that time? We can conclude, therefore, that Ezekiel dated his prophecies and his visions because he used the calendar to the, that allowed him to individuate the quality of the day of the year in relation to the week. This means that every year, each day of the year, was always in the same position regarding the cosmos. That's the beauty of this calendar. Again, this meant that space and time were interconnected dimensions of a higher whole. That's why he said at the beginning of the essay, these are scientific notions. This conception of the relationship between time and space was derived from the so-called astrolabes, all of them dating to before 1000 BC. These astrolabes divided the sky into 12 equal parts called months, each of them subdivided into 30 days for a total of 360 days. The horizon, therefore, was divided into 360 degrees. Mool Appin's compilation, name I have never seen that before, composed around the year 700 BC, follows along these lines, though Mool Appin's system is more elaborate. Quote, there are 12 signs, 
because there are 12 months in the schematic year of Mole Apin. I need to look that up. The signs were made of equal length in order to get months of equal duration. They were divided into 30 degrees each because the schematic months were supposed to contain 30 days each. This calendar uses the stars as points of reference, but its 360 days are in reality the 360 degrees of the horizon. It is a perfect calendar since it is built around the stars. It only needed to be adapted to daily life. I'm going to find out what mole appen means. Oh, oh, that's interesting. Mole apin is an astronomical compendium in cuneiform. Huh. That's M U L dot A P I N. And there are images of this as well on the cuneiform tablet. Looks to be a about the size of an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. I should say the proportion there. I don't know how big they are. Go to images and you can see it. And indeed, it's got a lot of cuneiform in it. And it is completely translated into English for you, you calendar mavens and addicts. Saki says, I'm unable to penetrate the complex ancient calculations that modern scholars have published, beginning with Strassmeyer, Epping, and most of all, Kugla, and recently, Glesma and Albany regarding the astronomical book using previously unknown documents. The relationship between time and space, however, is perfectly clear and is based on the one-to-one -one ratio between the number of days and the number of degrees of the horizon, which are indicated as days because the sky is divided into 12 parts corresponding to the 12 signs of the zodiac, whose counterpart is to be found in the measurement of time. Space and time are not two independent entities, and I would add, any more, but rather two coordinates measuring two dimensions in a single, unique cosmos. And this, among Hebrew literature, this is one thing that Ezekiel stands out for. Finally, the comprehension of space and time as being related, and the heavens, not just the sky or the clouds, but a very large or unending, may I say organ, may I say organism, Ezekiel accepted such a calendar and adopted it to his theology. The important thing is not that his visions took place on Friday or a Sunday, but the fact that he considered him, it, it important that he took note of it and consecrated it to memory. And this because for him, it must have been an important element of the vision itself. No other prophet, either before or after him, had done this. Apparently, for Ezekiel, the week was not simply a period of seven days, but rather the earthly projection of a cosmic structure, the structure of creation. Sacred and profane, past and future, history and prophecy take on values that they had not had before. Elohim had revealed himself on earth to the great prophets of the past. Ezekiel, in exile, had visions from beyond the heavens. Ezekiel 1.1 1, 1. You have been listening to Jackson Snyder Presents on Hebrew Nation Radio.